telling our good story to the nation. As promised, we were supposed to take battle of ideas last night. So Comrade Kumbuzo had said that she wanted to first present it to plenary before she comes here. We tried to insist, but she has now presented to plenary and now ready to present uh, our document, our discussion, give the highlights of our discussion on the battle of ideas to yourselves. Over to you. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Uh, we, we were in the commission around uh, communications and the battle of ideas and we part of the work that we had to do on the battle of ideas was linked to the, uh, to the work that the commission on strategy and tactics was also dealing with. And what we acknowledge is that there, is, there was initially positive sentiment uh, towards the ANC after the 54th conference more so with the message of renewal and we've also noted the negative sentiments uh, against the ANC especially using the gauge of the local government elections and we acknowledge that part of that is because the economy has not grown much and is not been inclusive and we've got high unemployment we've got uh, inequality has deepened and poverty levels have risen. But we've also acknowledged that the problems of access to water, in particular in rural provinces, and also uh, the electricity uh, shortages or the uh, energy insecurity has also exacerbated to that. But also the notion that the ANC is not decisively dealing with corruption against its members and its leaders. And as a commission, our view was that the ANC has done a lot in terms of uh, the work that of delivering services to people, but the, the 54th conference outcome was faced with regression due to the pandemic also that came in in terms of rebuilding the economy and making inclusive. And all of us sitting here, we are aware there was a regression in terms of the economy due to the lockdowns uh, to 2016 economic levels, but now we have rebuilt back to 2020. I think the latest one says we have recovered to the levels that we were in. And, but the youth unemployment, even if we continue to increase the uptake, the level of youth who are entering the job market it's also very high. So if you, in the last quarter you realize there was an increase in the number of jobs created, but there was a, also an increase in the number of young people who have entered the job market. And our view is that we need to strengthen building an inclusive economy and stopping our young people from being job seekers to become job creators. And therefore, the, co the work that is being done by the Commission on Economic Development in terms of how do you enable SMMEs to participate meaningfully and to sus be sustainable sustainable and to grow becomes very important. We then dealt with the issues that we, to say how do we then deal with the message around um, uh, access to water, for instance, and access to electricity, roads infrastructure, and the weekend public safety. And first there was an acknowledgement, and which is the work that was also done by the Commission on uh, Peace and uh, Stability on that public safety is not only a policing issue, it's also a community issue. So they, we must start to create a message as the ANC and also the ANC-led government around the role of communities in making sure that the, their own communities are safe because criminals and all these uh, people reside within communities are known and we must cooperate with law enforcement agencies to make sure that, and that message must come through, to say communities are not passive recipients and then the ANC branch must become strong. Therefore, we resolve in terms of how do we strengthen that we're going to strengthen our Department of Information and Publicity to play a critical role in making sure that the ANC communication machinery is it's, it's, it's strengthened across, including at the level of a branch, to say maybe at a branch level, we must have a branch spokespersons who are going to then say this is the position and communicate eloquently, eloquently and fluently and clearly. But we also say the message of the ANC cannot only be carried by ANC leaders and ANC spokespersons, it must also be carried by the totality of its membership. Therefore, ANC members at all material times must be aware of what are the policies of the ANC and positions of the ANC, and we must continue to have those deliberations so that an ANC leader can be able to articulate. For instance, on service delivery, if we talk about water, electricity, access roads, and whatever is the concern of the community, an ANC leader at a branch level, an ANC member, they have access to 
to the councillors because it's them who have elected them other than ordinary members of the community and our work is to say the ANC leadership must then communicate what are the measures that have been taken, but ANC members must also communicate to those deployed cadres to say this is the challenge that we are faced with in our communities because they've got access to them. And that's the work that we, we are doing to strengthen that machinery. That's the, the gist of what we have, we've, we've discussed. But also the commission noted that the mix, the, there's a mixed messaging that comes out in the ANC. And that mixed messaging, particularly the Commission participants blamed the parallel communication from members of the ANC, and we have said there must be respect of the ANC communications protocols on a position articulated by the ANC from the DIP that members of the ANC NEC must communicate that because our view is that DIP must at all material times irrespective of their preferences and personal views. They must communicate positions of the ANC as articulated by its own conventions, its own ethos, principles, and what is discussed, not influenced by any other interest. And therefore, all of us must toe the party line when the message has been there, and we can then become this uh, one, uh, multiple voices, uh, uh, but one, uh, one message. We also had, an, uh, the discussion was not limited on the battle of ideas. We also had to discuss issues that relate to uh, broadcasting in the media space and also ICT. The first part on broadcasting, we acknowledge that broadcasting remains a critical player in disseminating information to the public. And it's also secured in terms of how it's regulated and so forth. And then we need to strengthen the broadcasting sector. In particular, the public broadcaster must be strengthened. The proposal that, we have to, that has been tabled is the issue of saying the SABC has both the commercial mandate and also the, the public mandate. In the public mandate, we want the SABC to be funded from the, from the national fiscus, but also proposing a broadcasting household levy for, so that we can all fund. Because the, the TV license arrangement is not working. It's actually impacting on the ability of the SABC to survive. And we said the SABC commercial wing must be allowed to compete and be regulated the same way that commercial broadcasters uh, compete and therefore they must be given that space and we, uh, the, the government has been mandated to finalize the bill that makes that distinction. But we want the SABC to also and the public broadcaster level to become, a, to play a developmental role. Education channel must be used optimally. The health channel must be reintroduced. The, and history channel must come through because we should not be watching other people's history but our own history and also the history of this uh, the continent but also the children's uh, channel must be introduced and those must be funded from the the, the national fiscus we uh, and uh, so that is one but we've also noted in the uh, in the broadcasting space or commun uh, community media there's been a proliferation of community media which is not helping its sustainability but there's not been a focus on building it to become sustainable but when the media, and we acknowledge that when Media Diversity and Development Agency was established, it was to allow entry of black people, women, youth, and, previous, and, and people with disabilities and previously disadvantaged communities to participate without the onerous sunk costs that were required. But there was intention to accelerate or progress community media. Instead of getting community media to be stuck in one place and not progress to become commercial, we're saying there must be a path that is made to allow them to progress, but they must be equally supported and the regulations must be reviewed because they are very um, onerous so that they can then be competitive and commercial. The other issue that we focused on, we focused on the issue around spectrum and the spec, uh, the re acknowledging the work that's done to release spectrum. We say spectrum is a national scarce resource, but its release and assignment, because we're going to do further assignments of the spectrum and licensing, it must be done to allow also the um, transformation of the sector, therefore black people must participate, women, youth, but also that spectrum must not be used only for mobile telecommunication, it must be used in agriculture, health, education, and mining, and other sectors, and also to the introduction of new industries. In that regard, we said the, with, uh, the spectrum licensing and release, we had a over 17 year delay in the country. We should make sure that it's released at a minimum, at the same timelines that the ITU, International Telecommunication Unions, uh, uh, prescribes for the release of the new set of spectrum so that we are not left behind because of technologies. We've also dealt with the issue around access, uh, universal access to connectivity, that we must make sure that there is universal access to connectivity and ensure that fiber to the home deployment is possible. And then the state digital infrastructure company that is being uh, uh, concluded now it's, it's in terms of its uh, establishment or its consolidation. 
must then be awarded spectrum, one, to, to do the developmental mandate and allow SMME participation, but two, to consolidate the government infra, uh, fiber infrastructure across to enable participation of SMME to transform the sector at more favorable terms, but also to, for the rollout to rural areas. And that government must do a rollout, uh, one, uh, a roadmap for the shutdown of 2G and 3G uh, in consultation with industry, but also the rollout of uh, three, uh, 4G and 5G, including to rural areas, because they cannot be left alone if the, the economy is going to be di uh, 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 digital. And I think the last thing that I just want to emphasize on, on, on this one is also the commitment that we must, government must make sure that we we develop a blueprint for the digital economy because the di digital economy is not coming, is not the future, it's here. And uh, our target is to say by 2030, 30%, at least 30% of South Africa's economy must be digital. So by 2023, government must release a digital economy blueprint for the country to say what, how we're chaining ourselves today as we prepare both to, digital, to digitize and digitalize government, but also to digitize and digitalize uh, um, uh, society and the last matter on the post bank that by 2023 we the post bank must be corporatized to become a state bank and must be the one that is uh, distributing uh, social grant um, services to our people thank you thanks uh, uh, comrade Kumbuzo for the highlights of uh, <coughs> the policy discussions on the battle of communications and the battle of ideas. We are now going to open the floor for questions. So what will happen is that we, just, we allow them to ask all the questions and then you answer. Okay. What, do we have a roving mic? Okay. Um, Mali Titani from Newsroom Africa. Um, Mr. Chavini, you speak of uh, a broadcast levy aside from TV licenses. Did you perhaps also explore the era in which we find ourselves where more South Africans are making use of streaming? I'm here. <laughs> okay. It's Mali Titani, Newsroom Africa. Um, you spoke of a broadcast levy aside from TV licenses uh, when you speak of the public broadcaster. Did you also maybe perhaps explore um, in an era where we're living where people are making use of streaming services and are not um, making use of traditional media? And if you speak of a broadcast levy, how is that going to work in an era where people are not necessarily uh, consuming traditional media? Thank you. It's Christian de Plessis here from Network 24. Minister, did, did you discuss in the commission what the views of the ANC are about how the media is reporting on the ANC? And then just secondly um, to Mr. Mabe, uh, so how does the process work going forward? Uh, is the commission's recommendations after they're presented to, to planner, plenary, how does the process work going forward? Uh, Yes, thank you. Valentine, SABC News. Um, two questions. The one is on post office um, target uh, by 2023 to become a state bank. The what are your views or what has been the policy proposals that this uh, state bank will focus on? Is it just going to be about uh, um, releasing special grants or is it going to be developmental in nature in terms of um, having fund for the SMMEs and other entities that will need support? Finish support. It's of the SABC um, funding. The, there are a number of proposals that have been tabled, but the question is they only become a debate and that has got no end deadline. What's the deadline of finalizing these proposals for the funding of the SABC? It's Ndaya uh, Tonje from uh, Power FM News. Uh, just on the post office, 2023, is it a realistic target, um, seeing that it's literally a couple of months away? And uh, also, 
community media. There's a lot of community media that are spiraling out. Did you touch on the media development agency's role in terms of capacitating those community media? Because they play a primary role in uh, making sure that these uh, community media are sustainable. Thank you. Hi, uh, Tim Cox from Reuters, and I'm, uh, my apologies if you've already been asked this, um, but I wondered if you had discussed the step aside rule and what conclusion was drawn, if any, and if, um, if also the nationalization of the central bank was discussed and if, that was, if any progress was made uh, on that front. Thanks. You realize what you with better of ideas? We are dealing with better of ideas. So step aside doesn't get to be discussed everywhere. We call some. So if this is better of ideas, communication, SABC, who's there? Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, my name is Tanya Talata from Newsroom Africa. Uh, just two things for me. Uh, just on the issue of um, the, the branches. Uh, the, I think the last time we were here, the 2017 policy conference, the diagnostic report spoke about how there was actually a lack of ideological discussion uh, within the branches. Ideological discussions within the branches. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, if that has improved and whether or not there were um, any debates around how to improve the level of, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideological or the, to, to increase the, the substance rather than the form uh, that is currently taking place yeah, within ANC branches. Um, yeah, no, I think I'm just going to end it at that. Thank you. Okay. Are these all, all the questions? Okay. Thank you. I thought I had somebody referring to a minister. There's no minister sitting here. There's a serious comrade sitting here. Uh, maybe just for my credentials. I'm a member of the PEC of the ANC Limpopo. I chair the subcommittee there on ETC, but I'm also considered an expert on media and ICT, so it's on that capacity that I'm sitting here. Uh, so there's no minister here. And I was a rapporteur of the commission, is the basis at which I speak. Uh, so I'm Comrade Kumbudzo. Uh, those of you who know me in another life, because I see my professor is also here, so she can call me her student. So <laughs> On, on the broadcasting levy vis-a-vis -vis the non-consumption of uh, the, the, the non-traditional consumption of, of media, that's why we're putting a levy, because what is critical is that uh, the public broadcaster in particular must survive. It's good. The survival and sustainability of the public broadcaster is necessary for this country, both even for the both commercial media and uh, public media. So we need that levy. And that's why we're removing the TV licenses. Because the TV licenses, the, those who, want, who work in the SABC will tell you, they've just become a burden because it makes the SABC unsustainable financially because they're sitting with a large debt which they cannot convert. So therefore, that's why we want to make sure. And we've, we are aware they've been given a waiver. Uh, both by the Minister responsible for Communications and Digital Technologies and the Minister of uh, Finance on what the board must decide to do around the, the TV licenses, they've, that waiver they've gotten. But we are going to put the broadcast levy so that all of us contribute to the survival and sustainability of the SABC. Linked to that is the issue that the SABC then must then broadcast content that is relevant, uh, both educational, informa informative and entertaining, so that we keep the South Africans there. But also that's why we talk about intro using the history channel because your streaming services will not provide us with that because we have no control on their content requirements. Though in the commission we've also proposed that there must be a governance framework of how they must, uh, that must be explored to make sure that they, everybody competes on uh, fair terms because you can't have people who don't pay tax, who have no license requirements to come in, who just come in and they do whatever, they're not regulated in terms of content, what they can produce or not produce. But in other, in other jurisdictions in the EU it's been done, we must do the same here. And in the US it's been done, we must do the same in South Africa for that. They, there's that firm proposal that uh, the government must do the, that, that one. And there was a question around whether um, uh, the commission deliberated on the, uh, how the media reports against the ANC. 
um, I'm looking at the head of DIP because he was he was he was in the commission. Obviously, we have uh, that's why we have noted the anti-ANC sentiment both in the media and, the, and, and in the public discourse. But our responsibility, our view is that the ANC can communicate to its members and to South Africans despite the, the media views because our branches must be the lifeblood of the communities where they reside. And therefore our branch meetings and community meetings that, remember, at a branch level, the branches are not only going to meet for their own sake, they must also convene community meetings on topical issues that affect their own communities. The, the ANC branch is not debating only about ANC policies, it's not debating only about, uh, uh, about um, uh, ANC leadership. The ANC branch also debates about service delivery in the community where they are. They debate about safety in the community where they are. So the branches must continue to convene. Uh, public meetings to communicate the ANC view. Before, during the apartheid period, the ANC was, was never supported by any media except the underground media, but we, it communicated to its membership. That's why it got the support in the country. So we're going to, to go back to that, and that's why we're part of strengthening our ability to communicate through an unmediated channels. But also, the social media platforms are not only available to the media. They're available to the ANC, depending on how the head of DIP and his DIP collective then runs the social media to, to make sure that South Africans can feel the need that where they need information about the ANC, the breaking news is not on the SABC or on any other platform, it's from the ANC page that will communicate timelessly and make sure that it has the following. So that we have got the channels. So we are not going to rely on third parties to communicate our position. We are going to uh, communicate, but we'll appreciate a non-antagonistic media, a progressive media. We're not saying it should not be robust, but we want the media to be fair, and that's why we also, co we were, we also complain to, through the right channels if there's been unfairness against the ANC, and because the, those provisions are there, we are allowed to do that. Um, and then it deals with the issue around whether the ANC branches are discussing the ideology as well. The ANC branch discusses both the ideology of the ANC but the responsibility of the ANC as leader of society in the community. Because leadership of the ANC society is not only at a superficial level, it's what you lead in your branch. We expect that if there are service delivery challenges in that branch, the ANC branch must lead that thing, supported that mass dem by the mass democratic structures. And we part of the work we are doing to make sure the mass democratic structures work is to deal with the issues, the challenges within a SAMCO, which the ANC branch must lead the resolution at the branch level. And then there was a question around the... I'm going to deal with the broadcasting issues uh, in one go on the community media and the role of the MDDA. Uh, so we have been... The commission was very specific around the pr proliferation of the media. I'll give you an example. In Bembe, you've got five community radio stations. They can never be sustainable. Targeting the same market, targeting... It, they can never be sustainable. So we're saying the MDDA, instead of continuing to get an ICASA license, new ones coming through, make the ones that are there sustainable. ICASA, Centec, we are aware that Centec has sent notice to many community media that they're going to switch them off because they've not paid a transmission fees. But if MDDA was using the funds to make sure that the transmission fees are paid or they, whatever they are subsidized, those media will be sustainable. If the MDDA was building capacity in the community media to run as profitable enterprises, there will be a different issue. If MDDA was championing the, the amendments of the regulation, for instance, in, in terms of licensing, my majority of you, I know that there are 45 radio stations who had to be switched off because they did not apply for the renewal of their licenses. Commercial uh, uh, broadcasters, when their licenses expire, they can write and request an extension and all these exemptions they get. But community media does not have. If they don't apply by the cut-off period, it, it, that's it, it gets switched off. Those, things that, those are the things that the MDDA must be championing. So the commission spoke about how do we recapacitate the MDDA role to play a supportive role. But also not to keep the community media stuck where they are. Uh, 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 Bay TV and KZN1, why are they not progressing to become a commercial TV station? Because they've got that capacity. MDDA should be playing a role to do that. And part of that, it must, we must amend the regulations and legislations that make sure that they cannot progress upwards. And allow them to progress upwards because they've proven their, their metal in the space. And they play a very effective role in communicating issues that relate to their own locality. So there was a full discussion on improving the role or strengthening the role of the MDDA, but also making sure the legislative and policy environment is amended to allow 
community media to be sustainable at all material times and that we must stop the proliferation because you can have so much TV stations, you can have so much radio stations. It cannot be we are there's a number in terms of population size and viewers and you cannot be competing as if we are unlimited and there are new platforms that are coming through that are also very competitive. Then there were issues around the the SABC funding to say by when it has been an ongoing discussion. So the levy, the levy should come through in the bill that is going to cabinet and then go to parliament. Uh, that, that proposal will come through family and how the commercial wing and the public wing must, must be managed to come through strongly. But we have also acknowledged that in terms of health, and I don't know how many of you lived in the era of Salt City, that there is provisions for education and awareness in the Department of Health. That funding in terms of awareness, part of it must go to the health channel of the SABC. In terms of education, the, Department of, the departments of education have programs to make sure that they can communicate through the media on education content true educational content, not normal briefings. And that funding must also be directed there, but it depends on whether the SABC board and management will be able to then actualize that. But those decisions should be available at, at, as a resolution, and the employees of the ANC government must make sure that, that it happens. And the SABC bill would, should come through by end of this financial year, should have been submitted to, to parliament. That is the, the commitment. And on the question around whether the post bank, not post office, post bank, the post office is a different animal. They are separated. The the bill, the final bill to separate the, on the post bank has, is on in, in Parliament already for their consideration. Uh, so the target is not very far. The the fit and proper assessments of the board so that we can have a fully fledged board because there is a, a board which is just low. It's, they are fi they are being finalised now with the relevant authorities and therefore the board should be able to come through. And related to that is the. The target of 20, end of 2023 is not, not far-fetched, it's realistic, it should be achievable. Because you should recall that this uh, resolution comes from the 53rd, 53rd if not 52nd conference of the ANC. So it has been in the works for the longest time. So we need to make sure that we can conclude th that work. And on the issue of the mandate of the Development Bank, it's not only to... Uh, of the post bank is not only to disperse uh, social grants. The mandate including, remember there are people who remain unbanked in South Africa, is to make sure that everybody who's unbanked can be banked because of the reach. That's why the proposal in the bill is to say they must use the post office infrastructure that is existing to make sure that they can have the reach and the footprint that they have. They are lucky they are, they are starting with a, with a footprint that is already countrywide, very intensive. Secondly, the, the other issue is, not, is to say how does government use the facilities because there's also a proposal that is in the works to say government banking must then go to the post bank as a state bank. Why you do that? Because we can then use that to intervene in funding SMMEs allowing participation where government can take risks on uh, uh, previously disadvantaged community youth, women, people with disability and rural area people where the commercial banks will, will not do. If you recall in 2020 when the um, I forgot the credit guarantee scheme. When the banks were given, the commercial banks were given the, a, a guarantee for credit for SMMEs and also for, for businesses that were collapsing, they simply, they simply stuck with their traditional uh, clients and did not want to expand in, anywhere else. Despite that, government said for anybody who fails to repay, government will then guarantee uh, guarantor and repay. So the state bank will be able to, to, to step in in those matters. So it's not only for SMMEs, but also for other interventions where there will be enough resources through the state bank to intervene to grow the economy. Because remember, majority of our challenges in the economy was that access to funding or, or growing this economy has been challenged. But when you have a state bank and have that capacity, you should be able to grow the economy. In terms of those questions that relates to me uh, and the commission that we were, I was a rapporteur for, I think I've covered those. I didn't cover the issue around the step-aside rule. I thought the briefing was done. And also the, the, the central bank issue, it was also coming in the economic... Um, uh, economic Transformation Committee, and I think I've covered the issue around the, 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 the branch uh, discussing ideology. There's firm proposal in terms of the constitution that, that was dealing with uh, constitutional amendments in terms of the membership renewal and how the membership uh, process of the ANC to make sure that you've got more substance in the membership of the ANC than any other thing. Those proposals have come through. Thank you. No, 
Thanks, uh, Comrade Kumbuzo. Just to also add, as uh, head of DIP in the African National Congress, and to also help members of the media, DIP means Department of Information and Publicity. What we have done to <coughs> drive the point that Comrade Kumbuzo was making around making sure that uh, we push our own narrative as well was to consolidate ANC Today. In the past, ANC Today was just a simple letter from the president. You now have got access to ANC Today. It's a proper digital publication. It comes out every Friday. Actually, just uh, this Friday, we distributed our ANC Today, which was a special edition focusing on the policy conference. Last week was a special edition just focusing on the legacy of our Deputy Secretary General. We also went as far as increasing our own social media reach. We had just uh, fewer than 400,000 uh, followers on Twitter and even on our own Instagram and Facebook. In the four years that we have been there, with the things that we've done, the digital campaigns that we drove, we've been able to push that number to just over a million. Now, these are not bots. These are real people who follow the story of the ANC. And what did we also do? We also went as far as consolidating how we communicate with yourselves. Unlike in the past, we now use various other platforms to be able to send you, whether it's press statements, invite you to our briefings and all of that. Actually, Comrade Kumbuz, we had only we had allowed for 200 journalists to attend this. We now have got 453 which now begins to tell you that the platforms that the ANC is using to communicate with yourselves are quite effective. We're using our portals to allow to, to be able to accredit you and all of that. And because we've got communications protocols, the expectation is that all those who speak for the ANC will have to make sure that they subject themselves to all of those uh, protocols and always stay on message, not necessarily reflect on what is uh, their own uh, personal views. And we have seen this working. Actually, we are able to also uh, activate the relevant sections of uh, Rule 25 if you are seen or making utterances that bring the organization into disrepute. We've already acted, I mean, they are, I don't want to mention comrades, but they are comrades that we've already acted upon using the communications protocols and the relevant sections of the ANC constitution. This must now demonstrate how effective these instruments that we have introduced over time are working. So there's quite a lot that we are doing in the communication space, just at the level of ANC communications beyond what Comrade Kumbuz was clarifying, there are also issues that the DIP of the ANC has done to be able to consolidate messaging of the ANC and make sure that even if you have got multiplicity of voices, it is still one message that comes out there. The narrative of the ANC must be understood to be one out in the public. As it relates to the question you asked around uh, what will now happen, Decisions taken at the policy conference are recommendations to the 55th National Conference. So whatever we, whatever we agree on here is a recommendation to the conference of the ANC, which now becomes the highest decision-making body of the African National Conference, of the, of the African National Congress, which sits in December. So the policy conference is very important as a precursor to what needs to happen at the National Conference. So, that now the recommendations is that now the recommendations for the policy um, uh, um, uh, sorry the national conference or does plenary have to still approve the recommendations and, and when will we know which recommendations have been no, approved? No, if okay let's say for instance the issues that comrade Kumbuz has deliberated upon uh, are highlights coming out of the commission of uh, the battle of ideas plenary engages take certain decisions decisions taken by plenary then become recommendations to the national conference huh? maybe just to add 
when we, when we end, conclude this conference, there will be recommendations, so you may not have the document tomorrow. There will be recommendations that will then get captured. They will be processed to the NEC, and then they are sent to branches to further engage on those recommendations, because it's not final. It, the proposals came through branches, engaged, came with recommendations. You'd, so you should not be surprised that, say, in one, on one issue or the other, there may be two different recommendations or three different recommendations. It's allowed to allow branches to further engage so that by the time they go back to the national conference, which will be in December, they then go with a branch mandate that says, in terms of this matter, there were three recommendations. Our preference is this. But there were, or there were these three recommendations. We think they can be a hybrid of this recommendation, and we can come up with recommendation number four. But oh, actually, in terms of what was recommended by the policy conference, we think we can improve on those recommendations, and our proposal is that. That's why this is not the beginning or the end of engagements on policy, NC policy discussions. This is just a consolidation of the refined views of the ANC branches as they come to the policy conference. And then we go back to the ANC branches to, ref to say, are we on same point here yeah, or are we on different? So, and we, we don't want you to come out and say, no, the ANC, they are differing, there's this view, there's that view. No. We, as somebody has said yesterday, today we are not producing a Bible for the ANC. To say, today we are producing draft manuscripts for the Bible that will be adopted or the Koran that will be adopted in December. And when that is adopted, then be, that becomes the ANC policy, which all of us, leaders in whatever capacity, branch, at whatever structure, deployed cadres, must make sure that those resolutions are implemented. And in our commission, we said the ANC-led government, through the Department of uh, Monitoring and Evaluation, must then do a template which the deployed cadres in government must then say, in terms of resolutions of the 55th conference and those of the 54th conference, how have they implemented that? And that's part of the recommendation, so that we can trace the, the, the recommendations. Because people think, and that's why the question of saying, is 2023 as it relates to the post bank not too, uh, too close for you to be able to meet that target? So, no, this recommendation has come from a long time ago, there was work in progress. Now we must be very decisive in terms of implementing those re uh, resolutions. Because you have always been accused, ANC have got very good policies. Nobody of you can question that. But the challenge has always been on implementation. Now we're saying part of what we must monitor and improve in that battle of ideas is to be able to say, we took this resolution as, the, as, as, a, as a, a party and we mandated our government to implement, this has been implemented, if not, what would have been the challenges? And we can all engage as South Africans in terms of the successes of engage, of implementing those resolutions, but we should be able to give you a clean and, and, and honest view of our progress with implementation, because we cannot rely on yourself as media in terms of implementation. We must come out and say, this is what we have implemented. You can come out and say, but the evidence on the ground is pointing to differently, and we can engage on that part and say, how do we improve on that implementation? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, you follow up. We have to take uh, archives. Ne? Okay, we can. Uh, so step aside, uh, central bank, those have been addressed. So step aside would belong to organizational renewal. The other ones were addressed as part of uh, ETC. If there are any specific recommendations that we make out of here, I'm sure we'll be able to engage with yourselves during the week. Actually, the ANC is going to be having numerous uh, other engagements going into the national conference. Uh, afternoon, Tepo Mwai, SABC News. Um, what's, what was the Commission's view on the current delays with the digital migration? Um, that's one. And then the Commission's uh, take on poor connectivity that we're seeing in some government departments. Poor? Poor. Poor connectivity with government network infrastructure, like I mean, home affairs, where we often hear that their systems are down and they cannot offer uh, service to the people. Um, and then, lastly, is on um, cheaper network, especially data being available to uh, the poor. Without Wi-Fi. Thank you. 
Moloko Miloto from ENCA. Kumbuzo, I think I heard you saying that you want the uh, post bank to start dispersing social grants 2023. Does it mean that recipients of the social grants will have no choice to continue receiving um, their grants either through retail stores like ShopRite checkers, but what about those who are currently receiving theirs through um, commercial banks? Secondly, I'm just wondering why considering the fact that already you have the African Bank, 50% of its ownership is in the hands of the South African Reserve Bank. Another 25% is in the hands of the Government Employees Pension Fund. Um, of course, with other smaller commercial banks or, or small commercial banks owning smaller percentages. Why are you not considering to use the African Bank as a state bank, considering that it's got the national footprint, it's got the infrastructure? Why do you want to revive uh, the post bank, which is moribund? More so because you also want to own the South African Reserve Bank, nationalize it. Okay. Is that? Thank you. Actually, the Commission noted significant progress made on digital migration. We've got five provinces that have been switched off, the provinces of Northern Cape, Free State, Northwest, Limpopo, and Pumalanga. And the, pro uh, the commission asked the government to conclude the uh, digital migration before the end of this financial year. And you should remember that the Minister of Communications and Digital Technologies announced the 30th of September as the last date for applications for those households that are poor that must apply for set-top box assistance of government. And also, you must also note uh, that the, maybe before I move to the next one, you must also note the constitutional court said the Minister of Communications and Digital Technologies must give the members of the public sufficient notice in terms of allowing them the ability to apply or to decide whether they want to apply for set-top boxes uh, f uh, assistance, those who qualify. And that notice is, and the court said, you must, it must, the minister must take into cognizance the fact that other notices were given previously and other work has been given. Since 2012, households have been applying for assistance of set-top boxes, so now the date for closing to apply is 30th of September. And when, that, when those applications have closed and the work of installing continues in the, in the provinces because we need to install uh, central boxes to everybody as government is committed. And when that date comes through, we should be able to, or even before that date, government should be able to access to say whether at what period would they have concluded installing for every household so that they can then determine the date of analog switch off and consult with both industry and the public. So that work, uh, the Commission has appreciated the progress made because this is the first time in the country that there are provinces that have switched off, that they've migrated fully, and the spectrum has been released uh, to the telcos, those who have done, who participated in the auction of the spectrum. It is for the first time uh, since, 20, since 2006 that that achievement and that progress has been made, and there's a clear path to, the, to analog switch off in the country. But also you must note that in the terms of the country, the Minister of Trade, Industry and, Com and Competition has prohibited the import and distribution of analog TVs in South Africa as of 1st of April 2022. There are no more analog TVs that are brought in the country, and also the Minister of Communications and Digital Technologies has then promulgated guidelines or to allow consumers to be aware of which ones in the market are digital television. So in the country, we're expecting that in the next two years, or even less, you are going to have no analog televisions around. And you should also note that there is a national coverage of uh, terrestrial network in the country. It means anybody with a digital television or IDTV can can be able with a use of an aerial can be able to plug in and do manual search or auto search and get their digital television. Those who live in areas that are mountainous, that the signaling cannot work, there is provision for the satellite coverage and that satellite coverage has been uh, available and in the market there are decoders also for satellite coverage. So there has been serious progress on that matter. The Commission appreciated that progress and encouraged government to conclude digital migration soonest so that we don't have congestions of network because we cannot achieve the rollout of 4G and 5 
5G to rural areas if analog television is still available because you will not free the necessary spectrum for that part. And in terms of poor, it's not poor connectivity that you, you have. Uh, in where you have departments of home affairs, department of justice, department of police, where you have uh, network failures. There are uh, three factors to that. One, we're still using applications that are based on old uh, technologies or old language. And for the sake of national security, I'm not going to mention the applications that are still using natural adabas. Even myself at school, I didn't study COBOL and adabas at all. But imagine if in my age I didn't study those languages. You don't have people to maintain those languages. Those, uh, those uh, applications are very high consumer band, uh, high in consumption of bandwidth, but they are also very slow. For instance, if you have to print a salary advice, you run a full batch. You don't run, do say you want to print a salary advice of Mulut, uh, uh, Muluk or Mulot. You run a full batch of everybody sitting here. And that's, that's not sustainable. So that's the one factor. But also the network of majority of these departments is not compliant with the upgrades in terms of speed. They are not even sitting, they're sitting on edge, majority of them, but they have to move to at least a 10 um, uh, megabits per second transmission. We have a plan to improve all of them as part of the SA Connect to be at 100 megabits per second. And that's part of the work that we are doing on SA Connect uh, to make sure that government can digitize and, and digitalize. I think the Minister of Communications Digital Technologies announced that by 2023 March we need to be paperless and to do that you should have network capacity to do that. The State Information Technology Agency is working fervently to make sure that the network upgrades with the departments are done and we're going to put the necessary schedule out uh, with, the, with the relevant departments to improve. They, you must make an acknowledgement that there has been an improvement in home affairs. But the third issue is the issue of when you have load shedding and we have batteries. Batteries cannot run for, two, for more than four hours, but if load, uh, for more than two hours. If those uh, UPSs run for more than for the two hours and the load shedding is more, then you're going to have a challenge. But also theft of those batteries and those generators that are there that are backup. That has been an issue. That's why the commission supported the, the recommendation that was made by the Commission on Economic uh, Transformation on saying there must be a ban on the uh, export of tr uh, scrap metal in the country to protect critical network infrastructure that, uh, that is being uh, uh, damaged because of theft. Most of you see the copper cables that are uh, stolen, both for the towers and also for electricity, the rail networks and all those things. So, but that happens because of the scraping of uh, metals. And then you raise the issue of cheaper data. The, commi uh, the, com uh, the communication, uh, the committee, commission, excuse me, had a discussion around uh, government working on a proposal around uh, data, as uh, free basic data without burdening the the the, the fiscus the national fiscus there should be those modalities and on post bank visa and social grants if government has to use its own muscle and power government entities must be able to use the the, the muscle and the power and make the interventions that are required the first part you say why not african bank african bank must be supported to remain a commercial bank that competes that is owned by black people because the other banks are not owned by black people so why should we make a bank that is owned by black people make it a state bank black people must participate in that so we need multiple more banks to participate in that space so our support for the african bank is that it must remain viable even the interventions that were made by the central bank to save the the african bank was to make sure that we have uh, we diversify the financial sector if we are going to have transformation in this country because access to capital and access to funding is critical for the diversification of the economy. So I'm not going to deal with the ownership of the African bank, whatever. It has to be supported to be viable as a commercial bank because it's owned by black people. And in terms of the post bank, post bank will have to do, because currently the arrangements that are being done have been done with the post office. Post bank must do its own commercial arrangements. If it's sustainable, and I don't understand why should we take government money to generate interest for commercial banks when the state bank can generate interest on its money and use it for other interventions. 
So the post bank will have to say what is viable and what is in its commercial interest in terms of how it disseminates uh, and distributes uh, uh, social grants. If we have to move everybody, because we, our proposal is to say government employees must be paid from the state bank. We could, you could take your 40%, we can get into that account and you transfer it to any other bank of your choice, but that money must start into the state bank. Because it's our money, we need to make sure that we can raise enough, because the more you deposit money into a bank account, it generates interest. Those interests, some of it you earn, some of it the bank uses to, to, for transformational interventions. And we cannot be apologizing in terms of the interventions that we need to do to transform the sector and to raise money for government to be able to intervene. So that, that's the sum total of it all. Thank you. No, thanks, uh, Comrade Kumbuzo. This now brings us to the end of uh, the briefing on the battle of ideas. We are moving straight into culture and heritage. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Susan is here. She's going to be uh, giving you highlights on uh, archives, culture and heritage. Comrade Susan, it's rolling coverage. You need to come through. I'm sure you have been sufficiently clarified on communications. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's. yeah. As you. Is it not rolling? <laughs> hey. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm a little Oh, it's Comrade Susan and Comrade uh, Owen Babela, so. Yeah. But I'm with you. I'm with you. No, no, but, but I'm with you. And can I be claimed properly by the IP? I must be kidding. Yes. You must get there. You, you must get there at the top. Okay. Medium, ne? Okay. Yeah. Now, Chapman. Susan, I'm not a file to my substance. Huh? Hmm? I'm not a file to my substance. The optics. Okay. Okay. No, thank you very much, uh, members of the media. Uh, we need to just try and uh, keep it at analog level. Must keep it low. So, so members of the media, we, we, we are proceeding now uh, with uh, the second briefing on archives, culture, and heritage. So, I'm with the. Uh, Comrade Susan Shabangu, she's a member of the Archives uh, Subcommittee together with uh, Comrade uh, Obed Babela is also part of uh, that subcommittee. They participated in those uh, engagements. They will give the highlights, both of them. After giving highlights, we'll then open the floor for questions. Thank you, Comrade Pule. I want to start first by thanking this opportunity for us to make a presentation on behalf of the Archives Committee of the ANC. As the ANC, the section of uh, arts, culture, and heritage, it's one area which has not been given a lot of attention since 1994. And over a period of time, we have not being incorporating these matters in our work as the ANC. But where we are now, one of the key issues which we've agreed is that we need a commission which will look at the issues of arts, culture, and heritage. Because it's some of the areas which deals with the history of the ANC, but also history of our country. Therefore, one of the issues which we are recommending to this uh, policy conference. It's to have a standalone commission on arts, culture, and heritage. And we are happy that or satisfied that at least 
as we work through it during the NEC period, that has been accepted. Hence, we're tabling it today to the policy conference for adoption or as part of a recommendation which will be finalized in December. We believe it becomes important because uh, where we are today, part of our culture and heritage, they've been left behind. And one of the things which we're looking at as the ANC, it's the National Liberation Heritage Roots, which it talks to our history in our liberation struggle, but it also talks about uh, the various institutions which we have, some of them which has not, have not been transformed, but some of them are dying. So we believe that for us to move forward, we need to preserve our own culture, but also preserve heritage in our country. So what we are going to do today, we're going to indicate or come up with recommendations which were debated or discussed during the commissions on how best are we going to take this process forward, both at national, provincial, and local government level. As we know that uh, the issue of arts, culture, and heritage, it's cross-cutting in government, but also in the private space. So I believe that uh, we are here today to give recommendations in making sure that our history is there, but it's also incorporated into our education system. And as we know, some of the heritage sites are collapsing, and how best do we make sure that we capture them in our country without losing any of our history, or a history which deals with some of the few in an exclusive, exclusive way and leaving others. So that's what we are presenting today. I'm going to ask Comrade Obert to take us through the issues which are recommendations, and part of those recommendations have been agreed to by the Commission uh, as part of our recommendations to be finalized in December. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade. Uh, uh, Susan Shabangu and to the program director Bule Mabe and good afternoon to, to you journalists and then the viewers at home those who are viewing and those who are listening on radio also uh, good afternoon. I, indeed the commission had to look at culture as a standalone commission. It has never been there since 1990, uh, 1980s so we then had called for it to be a standalone commission. It has been granted very fruitful engagements and discussions that took place and then as a result of that even in december in the conference it will be a standing alone commission it's not the first time that the ANC reviews its own impact on certain policies and arrange our, uh, portfolios for it uh, as you remember international relations used to be not even there as a standalone commission but realizing the work of internationalism in the country we had then to establish the Department of International Relations. And here, uh, the commission was agreed to, and the establishment on Department of Arts and Culture uh, and Heritage is being proposed uh, for post the conference and hoping that the, the delegates at the conference will agree to the recommendation. And coming out of that conference will then be established in this department, led by an NEC subcommittee, which will then be composed by those who will be elected. Uh, part of the work is to centralize the work of the, uh, the, 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 the arts, culture, and heritage as, as it did in the 1980 globally, where the ANC used culture as a mobilizing tool uh, for our citizens, but then also OR Tambo, uh, having said that, will need to continue with this tool to mobilize people for the society we envisage and a society that is there in the national democratic revolution that is an unracial, non-sexist, uh, united uh, and a democratic and, and a prosperous society. So we then have to then begin to sharpen uh, this particular tool to achieve that particular objective. Uh, amongst the issues was the, the issue of the impact of the copyright and the performance protection bills. Uh, and infer that the two bills should be urgently be passed by Parliament 
which will assist in the protection of the creative industry and their rights and in advancing the economic interests of the industry and arts in particular. The Commission noted, however, that consultation was not as ad uh, adequate and therefore we need them to go to the sector, engage them further, uh, listen to their issues that they've raised uh, and, then, and then begin them to also accommodate them in the bills. I know that there's resistance from the US and the UK and the EU in general because the, 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 some of the, the homogeneous uh, rights that they are now owning, they will then lose their rights of owning. And then those like in Bobe Music and then all those others that they are using in many uh, productions then will then benefit the South Africans and South Africa need to come. They are, we know that they are threatening that if we push these bills, they might then punish us in their Agoa uh, arrangements and trade agreements. We are ready for that and we don't want Agoa obviously to be impacted because there will be a lot of jobs that will then be bleeding there. However, we cannot then give copyrights and performance protection to other people and so forth. And the commission was quite strong also that the actors that participate in some of the international movies, they are not paid equally to these international actors that comes in and perform. You can look at majority of the movies that were produced uh, in South Africa and in the African continent. Payment parities is not the same. So the commission had also said these bills will help us in dealing with those. We also take a note that the there are fiscal challenges. However, the budget cuts that affects arts and culture and heritage uh, should then be looked, re looked at so that we position arts and culture as a center of social transformation and regard it as a national priority. The Commission also recommended that the ANC should promote intergovernmental cooperation of the departments that are bearing on arts, culture, and heritage. This includes, but not limited to sports, arts, and culture, Department of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, Environment, Basic Education, Department of Defense and Military Veterans, Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Department of Social Development, Department of Tourism, Trade, Industry, and Competition. I mention this because there's issue that there are more taverns in the townships and recreation facilities. And all these departments must then contribute in the space now, also ensuring that we realign that space for more uh, creative and then sports and then uh, playing fields to be available for young people and reduce the number of them relying on taverns as a form of entertainment. But they need to go there and be creative and then so that they can then arise as champions from their own provinces playing in the national learner and but also looking at it as an economic activity because if tourism grows on heritage sites and cultural sites we are able to then to get those women and men who can then trade in the goods that are well produced there the, the traditional goods that will then be selling to the tourists and so forth. Hence, this department are then called in to come in. And then we then looked at certain programs that we then said uh, they, we need them to also support, as they said, the decolonization of the heritage spaces. And then, as you know, that there was a police movement that was there. We need to be, give clarity, policy position, and then theoretical and uh, uh, organizational thinking around these issues and give it guidance and direction. So, and also which are these spaces, what needs to happen in those spaces, and so that we could then give guidance to our structures on the ground. As part of the decolonization project also, the Department of Arts and Culture but initiated the resistance and liberation heritage route, the South African chapter, and now they will be moving uh, to the next phase of the program, which is the Southern Africa chapter uh, around that. There were colonial wars, and then also there were liberation wars that we need to now to begin to recognize as a way of expanding our heritage and cultural uh, heritage. To bring consciousness, in particular to the youth, about the decolonization project, and then bring debates and discussion that are focused, that are informing, then that will also be enabling the Department of Arts and Culture, Basic Education, to, com to contribute to support heritage education in all the schools. The Commission also noted the following groundbreaking projects of African civilizations, the engagement with the House of Traditional Leaders, national symbols like the national flag, 
the distribution of the national passport, geography places, names, and standardization, copyright and performance, and then also on the flag, then the issue was such projects also need to be engaged from low bottom to up rather than up downwards. When we have to look at a heritage as a flag as a heritage, we also then begin to look. And there were contributions that says the flag must be flying in all the schools, in all government buildings, in all municipalities as a way of promoting this heritage and the embracement of the flag. And then the other bigger project must then go through those particular consultation from below uh, going upwards so that we can listen to the arguments and the views and the sentiments of the people on the ground and then not just announce major programs and so forth. Also, we also take pride in the accelerated implementation of the revise of the white paper on arts and culture, which uh, ANC will then be contributing with its base document of 1993-1994, informed by the Ready to Govern and also the Freedom Charter, that we need them to begin to expand the role of the arts and culture. Because in 1994, the department was given to the opposition ministries for two terms, and by the time the ANC person came in, the white paper was just limited to reconciliation and nation building and nothing else. And therefore, we are now going to be ensuring that this uh, reform of the white paper, which has started, the ANC inputs will be wider and more impactful, really to begin to occupy space in that particular area. The women in sport projects were also looked at, and, and that the pay parity must be equal for women in sport to the men in sport. Koyan and Heritage Route have discovered 13 nodal points across all provinces. That indicates that the Kwai had lived in areas not only confined to a space called Cape Town or Western Cape. So this will also be brought into the national space. Inclusive language development, including the repositioning of all our indigenous language, is also have been profiled in the discussions. And the recommendations of Ubuntu Botu Velus uh, is one element that uh, we said we are going to do diverse in our cultural values. Ubuntu has really shaped uh, the, 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 the heartbeat of our society. We need to then rebuild and ensure therefore that with the values that goes Ubuntu of respect, uh, respect elders, and then respect our environment, respect ourselves, uh, can then be brought in. The promotion of fine art, drama, theatre, films must also be introduced in the historically advantaged schools for children and, in the, and then so that those who are interested in arts can come in. This one was really emphasized much and then the department has reported in the commission that we have 300 uh, art centres now that has been established across the nation. And these are going to be the feeder centers to the provincial uh, theaters because only four provinces have been benefiting in the theater space. Johannesburg Market Theater, uh, Cape Town, the Artscape, uh, Durban uh, House, and then and also the the, 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 the Kabeha now as we call it. So, and yet other provinces don't have. So Limpopo is building one, uh, Northern Cape is building, Northwest is building, and so that these 300 art centers that are spread across the disadvantaged communities can then bring the talent into the provincial space and provincial spaces to see their kids also in, entering into the national space across any talents that are there, including the orchestra that obviously there are issues and, and debates around, so that we can then begin to see the transformation informed by the development uh, support that is, is there. The promotion development of funding public and art institutions and their value chain must be developed and to competitive standards, but fair across all uh, groups. On arts, ANC must be used a bottom approach in the promotion of the arts and should recognize its power as a tool to mobilize society. Commission also recommended part of promoting indigenous languages and the state must establish a publishing company or amend the mandate of the government printing work to also include the publishing company in it so that we can publish the books, the stories written in local languages and about South African experiences. Because if you leave it to the private sector, that languages publication does not happen. So the state must go and say, this is a market failure when we need to move in there and then see if maybe the, the printing works can then begin with that company so that you don't start afresh. The commission also noted the technology developments, the 4IR, 
in the digital space and we need to digitize a lot of our work, including occupying the space in the gaming industry on telephones uh, so that our indigenous games can be seen. Uh, when you open your phone, you go to the gaming, you get Kung Fu, you get all others, but nothing about stick fighting, nothing about uh, Iskamato, and nothing about Iskatameya, and all those things. So we need them to also then say, content developers must also come in, including protecting the, 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 the rights of the artists on non-fungible tokens as proactive strategy. Uh, and, then, and, and, and then because I'm giving just highlights, I will then be also saying the protection and promotion and then development of indigenous languages, including the choir and sent from extinction, those that are facing those particular extinctions. And, uh, and then therefore the commission uh, had all those wisdom to say, let's also begin to protect our treasures the burning of the library at the University of Cape Town was unfortunate. The burning of Parliament and other buildings uh, uh, put some of the country's treasures and heritage at risk. To mitigate this, the Commission recommends that a mass digitization program of our cultural heritage treasures as one of the ways of safeguarding and preserving them should be the route to go. Uh, so therefore then I think we'll then take questions uh, so that whatever I might have left out, then we can then engage it as just more a summary of the inputs. Thank you. No, thanks, uh, Brother Ops. We've got two options. We can take questions which is fine if we have the time, or I release yourselves to go to plenary because the president is going to be, so we're opening the, 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 the plenary now to yourselves. But if there is a burning question that you want us to entertain, we can do it quickly. Yeah. Where is the roving mic? Uh, I have a couple of issues here, Pule. Don't marginalize heritage yet again when you're already here. A uh, couple of things, three to be specific. On the financing of heritage sites. Uh, in 2018, there were issues around the Victor Fester prison. The last prison from, from which Nelson Mandela was freed uh, in a terrible state. There seemed to be some disputes over who should fund it, whether it should be correctional or tourism or even arts. You're talking of, of building more, but those that are there now are not being maintained properly. So what is the policy around this? You're talking of tourism, and yet there isn't attempt to uh, make sure that these tourist attraction sites are in a state that tourists can go to. So that's the first point, finance, who finances? Secondly, access to sites. You would recall in 20, 2018, just after the new president was elected by the ANC, he went to Kono to the graveyard of the uh, former president, the founding president of the republic, was denied access by Mandla on account of some temple ritual that had not been performed at the grave. Here you have a grave, grave site paid for by the state. It's a heritage site. A, a family member refuses to provide access, not just to anybody, but to the president of the republic. So this then speaks to issues around family and state. These sites are paid for by the state, and yet family members seem to have some, some, some family members. <laughs> they have a, a say, absolute say, on whether there's access or not to these places. Uh, that's, uh, that's a bit weird. And there's no outcry. I mean, I've seen your document here. There's nothing about that. Um, then you have what has come out as a selective repatriation exercise. Certain bodies are brought back to the country for a burial, others are left behind. It depends on which family makes a lot of noise. Mapita is back, Watan is back, Nzula is not back, the first black secretary of the Communist Party. Lastly, 
you have heritage assets being sold. I mean, uh, uh, one of the Mandela daughters sold uh, Mandela's uh, assets at some auction, auction in New York. Uh, prison key even. Shouldn't that be criminalized? I haven't heard anything about charges. Uh, and lastly, the law does provide for the state to expropriate heritage sites that are in private hands. There was an issue about the Sunlam building in PE, which was in the hands of some private owner, some Irish fellow. Sunlam building, a huge historical building where Steve Biko was tortured, uh, a porter died, and a whole lot of people in the Eastern Cape, that was a center of torture, a serious memorial site. Government didn't do anything. There were all sorts of negotiations. You probably paid a lot of money, and yet legislation says you can expropriate. The original copy of the Freedom Charter was sold in London somewhere by some fellow. These things are being stolen. But there isn't much noise about that. Lastly, on, on, on the point of accuracy, in your report here, you say the house in Bradford, Winnie Mandela House in Bradford, has been going through some renovation. I haven't heard anything about that. Is, it, is that really true? That's my last point. Thanks. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lukanya Talat. I'm from Newsroom Africa. Uh, thank you very much. All right, so um, in the Eastern Cape, I know uh, that there um, exists something called the Liberation Heritage Route. Now, I am not uh, familiar as to whether or not there are any uh, movements around the issues of the Liberation Heritage Route in, Cape, in, in the Eastern Cape. I understand now from this briefing that now that's going to be expanded how do we expand into Africa and look at developing this when <coughs> there's a route only in name but not function that exists in the Eastern Cape? Uh, just hold, uh, just a second issue. And then also on the issue of uh, funding of, of heritage sites. Uh, I know that obviously, I mean, Lily's Leaf we saw the recent troubles uh, that it went through. There's uh, the District 6 Museum uh, in Cape Town that is also in desperate need of funding. Um, and then the issue that Ubabu Leja and I had raised on Mamouini's uh, house in Brentford. Uh, what's the situation with that? I don't also uh, just mean to, I, and I know this one is a little bit personal for me, but there is uh, the Craddock Fall Garden of Remembrance that uh, in Craddock, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so far, since it was opened in 2013, government has spent about 45 million rand. It's had to be refurbished twice. It stands there, uh, it's, a, it's a white elephant. It doesn't get used for anything. The last time uh, it was used was uh, for something that was related to Fort Kalata that we did a memorial lecture there last year in November. I had raised issues with the Premier at the time because there was no water. There was no water in the toilets. We had invited a government minister. Imagine the embarrassment that we had to invite a government minister but there's no water. Every time we try and deal with the issue with the district municipality or even with the local municipality, we get shoved from pillar to post. Does the African National Congress actually take the history?